it, it's, again, my very great pleasure to introduce our next guest, Webster Tarpley. He is uh, literally one of the world's foremost authorities on terrorism, false flag terrorism in particular. And we were we're so privileged to have him with us tonight. Uh, he has a, a, a live weekly radio program on the, the RBN network, that is the Republic Broadcasting Network, every Saturday from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. Be sh uh, don't miss that. Um, it, accolades are not difficult to find when it comes to describing Webster Tarpley. In, in 1978, while he was living in Rome, he was hired by uh, uh, a member of the Italian government to investigate the assassination of Aldo Moro. And it, the results of that investigation were not that the Red Brigades, who were the Al-Qaeda, essentially, of their day in, in that area of the world, were responsible for this crime, but that the Red Brigades were actually a, a functioning arm of NATO intelligence. And, I mean, what better way to, to, to control the opposition than to become the opposition? Then you can pull all the strings and literally uh, you can create history at your will it's just a it's a uh, it's a plan that these people would uh, it, it's just too good for these people to pass up and uh, you know history is filled with examples of this kind of thing um, Webster Tarpley is also the uh, uh, author of the underground classic George Bush the unauthorized biography which is uh, I, I think we have some of those for sale out in the lobby unfortunately we only have one copy left of his next underground classic, which is 9-11 Synthetic Terror Made in the USA. We thought we had enough for everyone tonight, but apparently not. The second edition of that book has just come out. The third, the third edition is coming soon. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great honor to introduce to you all Webster Tarpley. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. I've, uh, I've been given 90 minutes. I want to thank the organizers. Uh, they've they've uh, promised me the hook at, uh, at 9.30. So I'm going to try to keep within the bounds, although I usually, I usually don't. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Seattle 9-11 Visibility Group, uh, whose work is uh, exemplary. They ought to do a, uh, a short study of how they operate and send, that, send a, a case of them to uh, many other parts of the United States to see how these things are, are actually done. So congratulations. Without further ado, I want to also share with you the results of, of uh, Barry Zwicker's box poll. Uh, for box one, the official version, the Kane hamilton uh, Zelikow Commission, we have zero. For box two, the unanswered questions uh, or incompetence negligence position with its variations, we have a total of 42 votes. For box three, the lie hop or let it happen on purpose position, we have 92. And for box four, uh, in the my hop column, made it happen on purpose, 292 votes. So this, this certainly tells us something of the temper of the times, and I'm sure we can, uh, we can get back to talk about some of these issues in just a moment. This is my thesis, that 9-11 is the central issue of our times, and it is the center of contemporary politics. It's the key to ending the Iraq war to avoiding a wider war with Iran, to avoiding attacks on countries such as Syria, Venezuela, North Korea, and ultimately Russia and China. It is therefore the key to avoiding World War III. The thesis that I'd like to share with you at the beginning is that this is the issue that gives you the greatest bang for the buck of any issue that there is. And indeed, it's the only one it's the only one that can change the course of world history over the next 6, 12, 18 months. Why so? There is in this country, I would say, a stratum of the population, it's about 35 to 40 percent of the United States. 
These are people of very low political sophistication, very low awareness, they're poorly informed. Above all, they are terrified. They are literally scared out of their wits. They have bought into the terror demagogy of the Bush-Cheney regime. There, and of course, there is no way to address them directly about issues that concern us, Iraq, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, torture, secret wiretapping, dictatorial totalitarian measures on the home front, black sites, renditions, uh, and so forth. This 35 to 40 percent is largely impervious to all of those issues. They will say, if you confront them with any of these, this all has to be, that is the war, of te war on terror, we are defending ourselves against the September 11th attacks. You don't make any headway, you get no traction. Therefore, it is absolutely indispensable to put 9-11 truth into the center of all political activity. Are you anti-globalization? The same questions apply. Are you concerned about the situation of immigrants? The same. The demagogue Tancredo now says one of the reasons we need to put Mexicans in concentration camps is because Al-Qaeda is among them. They've been infiltrated. So this is the first refuge of every tin horn fascist demagogue. 9-11. And if we didn't know it ourselves, Karl Rove has reminded us with his speech in January, once again reminding us, as Barry recalled, that he has announced that 9-11 will be the signature issue of the Bush-Cheney Republican coalition for the year 2006. What more do we need? So therefore, I urge you not to heed the siren calls of people, I think, appearing even in this hall who have told you that the 9-11 issue is dead. The 9-11 issue is not dead. Take it from Karl Rove and read it in the great book of political reality. 9-11 remains at the center of everything. So that's my motivation to people from other directions, right? The 9-11 movement is numerically limited, but the political impact is tremendous. And if others will join in on this and integrate this into their own agitation, and propaganda, we will really begin to see tremendous results. Now we have a problem, at least I feel, is uh, with a group like this, and I don't know uh, a lot of people here, you have some people who have just come in off the street knowing very little, and others who want to get to the most esoteric and recondite aspects of, uh, of technical analysis. So I've got to try to do both, and I've also got to try to keep going. Uh, this is my book. I'm very happy to announce that this is currently the best seller on Amazon.com. It sells... <laughs> in the last uh, several weeks, and I, th I think generally in 2006, it has sold more copies than the official version, more copies than uh, Mike Rupert's book, more copies than David Ray Griffin, and so on down the line. And I think that there is a, a reason. It's somehow correlated with the prevalence of MyHop. If you're looking for full political MyHop, invisible government MyHop, rogue network MyHop, I'm afraid my book is the only one that's originally published in English that gives you that uh, in a uh, relatively consistent and relatively comprehensive way, as I'll try to show you. Now my story, again, who am I? Uh, I, I came to this from studying NATO spheres of influence terrorism, um, geopolitical terrorism designed generally to defend the Yalta division of Europe. And this is the Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro having been kidnapped and about to be killed by the Red Brigades. He appeared in the uh, Italian press in a picture with the news of his own uh, kidnapping on the front page. And behind him was a flag that said Red Brigade. So when we made this in, in 1978, we took out the Red Brigade's flag. We put in the British flag. We could have put in the NATO intelligence flag, but not many people know what that looks like. So this gave us a greater recognition. The idea is that this was, like 9-11, a state-sponsored false flag synthetic terrorist campaign, similar in that sense to the German Bader Meinhof group. This is something that I wrote back in 1991 about the tendencies you could already see under Bush the Elder 
towards what I called at that time administrative fascism, a kind of top-down bureaucratic authoritarian repression which did not have the mass movement aspects at that time of the, uh, of the fascist movements, but which we now perhaps do, do in fact see. And here is George Bush, the unauthorized biography. This is the book that established the connection between Prescott Bush and Hitler. I won't go into any details, but the notion that Prescott Bush, the grandfather of the current tenant of the White House, was behind uh, the rise to power of Hitler. He's part of the concentration camp management structure and also part of the management of the German Nazi military industrial complex. And you can see this book with the characteristic orange cover shows up in these... Uh, war Room, this is that uh, guy, he's on television still, I think. There is the Bush and uh, Carville, right? These, uh, uh, to call these guys left gate gatekeepers would be giving them uh, too much. But you can see how they conducted their campaign. They had a handbook and, uh, and that was it. Now, in terms of anniversaries, somebody said anniversaries before. Hey, for, uh, Thursday was the 25th anniversary of the attempt to kill Reagan. <laughs> no, no, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait till you see, and this is a mistake, let me tell you. Reagan was wounded, right? The Houston Post, March 31st, 1981, right? That was 25 years ago, Tuesday, uh, Thursday. Ah, but what do we see? Bush's son was to dine with suspect's brother. Wait a minute. Bush's son was to dine with suspect's brother. It turns out that H the gunman Hinckley, the, the madman with Jodie Foster on his brain, had, uh, had been meeting, he had an elder brother, Scott Hinckley, who had been meeting with none other than Neil Bush, Silverado Neil Bush, the brother of the current tenant of the White House, Neil also being the guy with the great connections to the Emir of Dubai, that well-known degenerate who uh, has been so much in the news lately. And there it is again. But is it confirmed? Yes. Bush's vice, Bush the elder now, vice presidential office, confirms that his son, Neil, was to have hosted Hinckley's brother at a dinner on April 1st, 25 years ago, yesterday. Today, today sorry. No, today? Uh, no, it would have been April, but it, the dinner would have been on April 1st because the shooting was on the 31st, I think. And here's Silverado Neil in uh, Denver confirming for the Rocky Mountain News, yes, uh, he was interested in the oil business and Scott Hinckley was in it. So there he was. Now, with this kind of thing, wasn't that the basis then for a special prosecutor or some kind of an investigation? There was none because Bush the Elder presided over a cabinet meeting saying that Hinckley was a lone gunman who had acted alone. So please let them not come to me with stories of conspiracy theories and paranoia when you have this kind of stuff going on in the world. This is no government of laws. This is an oligarchical uh, zoo that we've got going, and these <laughs> characters are the, the beneficiaries. And when you get to the Bush family, as I've documented, you are scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> so uh, that was 25 years ago. So we're 25 years into a complete regime of, uh, of lawlessness. Let me just point out, one of my big themes tonight is the question of drills, right, exercises. On that day, they had scheduled for the next day, the Friday, a presidential succession drill called Nine Lives, which indicates that part of the Hinckley operation was somehow conduited or bootlegged through the official U.S. government bureaucracy, that is, the assassination of Reagan went through the pipes of the official establishment under the cover of a succession drill. And this is a concept that I need because this is what I want you to understand. If you want to have a large-scale synthetic terror operation, design it as a drill. Make it a drill that closely resembles what you want to do, so much so that replacing a few things, right, replacing one gas with another or powder with a nuclear bomb in a suitcase can give you the result that you want. Now today we have to talk about 9-11 the most spectacular of these uh, questions. And we're, we're basking right now in the, uh, the questions raised by Charlie Sheen. I have to say, Charlie Sheen has done more in one week than the entire Democratic Party in five years. Yeah. 
He's gotten, he's gotten 82 or 87 percent support. It's something like 85 percent support of the American people. And on March 20th, his famous interview with Alex Jones hit the airwaves. On the, that Friday, I was fortunate enough to be on the Alex Jones program with him. And we had then CNN headline news picking it up, show business tonight for three nights in a row. There was also a very interesting article in New York Magazine, which I recommend you can read online, nymag.com, I believe. And it, looks, it looked for a while as if the dams were breaking. The worm was turning, as Charlie Sheen said. The worm is turning on 9-11, and I still think this is possible. It seems to me that there's a faction of the ruling class that wants to keep the 9-11 issue alive, shove it in Bush's face periodically, and use it to bludgeon Bush Cheney into some kind of submission on policy issues. They're very unhappy with the military defeat in Iraq. They're, they're very unhappy with the death agony of the dollar, which we're living through. And uh, somehow the resonance of what Charlie Sheen had to say, I think, hangs together with that. But we're living in a time of great hope in terms of 9-11 truth because we've just gotten a cycle of publicity which is greater than anything attained really since the Kane Hamilton Commission came out. And that was all negative. And the only thing in the meantime has been Jimmy Walter attempting to do these things with his own money. Now, my slide didn't come out too well, but if you want to see a good Charlie Sheen movie, I recommend Shadow Conspiracy. It shows him as a White House official fighting a rogue network. It's a network of four or five or six generals, top bureaucrats and others who want to kill the president and take over, have a coup, and Charlie Sheen is fighting them. I think this is vintage Charlie Sheen, and of course his, his association with Oliver Stone is well known. Now the kind of terrorism we're dealing here with here is nothing new. This is 400 years ago last November 5th, another anniversary. Brackets, I do have a slideshow on this, which would take another two hours, so if people want to get it, I suppose they can come to me or they can come to the, to the organizers. Uh, this is the 5th of November, 1605. The 5th of November, of course, is Barry's birthday, so we have to remember that. He thought that on Guy Fawkes Day they were, they were celebrating his, uh, his birthday. This is... Guy Fawkes, right, these are the memes, Guy Fawkes with his boots and his spurs and his lantern going into the House of Lords. He wants to blow up the King, the Lords, and the Commons, James I, back in 1605, and he's being caught. This was blamed, of course, on the Pope and the Jesuits, and it led to the foundation of the British Empire in war with Spain and later with France. These are the patsies of that era. In particular, Thomas Percy, a double agent, Robert Winter, another very likely double agent, and the chief dupe, the kind of Zacharias Musawi of the group in some ways, <laughs> Guy Fawkes, who seems to have gone along because he just liked military affairs. He liked the idea of blowing things up. He'd been a soldier in the Low Countries and he'd blown up fortresses and that was his job. So he. He liked to do it. Uh, of course, this guy has been demonized so much that uh, bin Laden, of course, is, is a relatively mild case in comparison. This is the, the target, you might say, King James I, who was not witting about the whole operation in advance. But uh, Lord Cecil, the Prime Minister, and Venetian intelligence, the, the great power in the intelligence world at that time, wanted to push him into war with Spain. And he didn't want to have a war with Spain. As a matter of fact, he wanted to marry his son to the daughter of the Spanish king for reasons of money and power. But the uh, Cecils and the Venetians didn't want that, and they won out. And here is the game master of the entire thing. This is Lord Robert Cecil. If you read uh, Shakespeare's plays, you'll find him appearing in such roles as that of Caliban in The Tempest, the misshapen monster. This is him. Uh, his father is Polonius, but we, we can't get into all this. He is the organizer, he's the Prime Minister of England and the organizer of the gunpowder plot. So he, orga he tries to organize what the British would call an own goal against his own government, but of course he nips it in the bud and the king owes him everything and his position is assured for many years to come. More recently, We've had such cases as the blowing up of the Maine in Havana Harbor back in 1898.
This is the calling card of the current rogue network. In my book, I attribute the crimes of 9-11 to an invisible government, rogue network, secret team, deep state, which goes back to the group that put the bomb inside the main, blew it up. All the indications are that the explosion came from inside the ship, not outside. This led to the Spanish-American War and to the founding of the American Empire. This is where we go from a republic to an empire. I would point out that the invisible government actually came into existence a few years earlier at the time of Grover Cleveland, when J.P. Morgan seized control of the public debt of the United States in the name of the British banks. That's the moment that the invisible government currently comes together. So therefore, I have to warn you, if you think that getting rid of Bush Cheney will solve everything, this is a mistake. It is indispensable. I'm all for it. I work for it every day. But what we need is something much greater. We need to root out entrenched, invisible government networks of Wall Street financiers, London financiers, as well as neocons and their tools in the, uh, in the invisible government. Thank you. The British, the British, by the way, came along because they, they thought that the Germans might get the Spanish Empire, so they decided, we'll give the Spanish Empire to the Americans. When Rudyard Kipling wrote, wrote Take Up the White Man's Burden, he was saying, please defend the British Empire from Germany by taking the Philippines. And this is the propaganda of the day, right? The Hearst Press. So here's the main, and here we have these Spaniards, right? We have algunos bin ladenitos españoles. <laughs> and they're looking through their periscope. And here's the ship, and here's the sinister underwater mine with the cables leading back, and they're about to blow it up. And it says up here, this picture fixes the responsibility to the satisfaction of the American people. <laughs> but the picture is a complete fabrication. So nothing has changed. <laughs> this is what we've had. This is what we have today. And of course, McKinley didn't really want the war, but he had no choice. Ben McKinley was a whole lot better than Bush, uh, who jumped on this immediately. So here we have the Hearst Press, right? The New York Journal, Journal American, uh, pushing this hysterical war propaganda. We've also got the Gulf of Tonkin. This, I think, has a significance for people in the room who are maybe my age. Uh, all those people who died in Vietnam, all your friends and all the three million people in Indochina. Back last fall, the National Security Agency officially conceded that the Gulf of Tonkin had been a fake and that it had been done by middle-level employees covering up for their mistakes. Uh, so, too bad, uh, three million dead. Think about what this means. Pause sometime in the next couple of days and think about what that meant for the agony of families and people who believed that and the, the Congress that allowed itself to be stampeded with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, just like the 9-11 resolution of September 01. Here's the equivalent of the Warren Commission report, the 9-11 Commission report. It is much inferior to the Warren Commission. It never attempts to prove anything. It starts off by assuming what you'd have to prove, and it takes it from there. That's the logical fallacy known as begging the question, petitio principi. And we had this dubious Ms. Rittenmeyer, I believe, on CNN Headline News. Uh, she happens to work for a, a company owned by one of Bush's fraternity brothers, and she said that she had been the producer of the National Geographic, and that really, you know, to the vulgar or to the uninstructed eye, it might look like controlled demolition, but if you read this book, it, it will clear it all up for you. Well, I'm afraid not. And then we have, of course, the patsies. Here we have uh, you could think of Rudolf Valentino or somebody in the chic, right? Uh, must have, uh, Atta must have been looking at Rudolf Valentino movies for quite some time to learn that penetrating uh, uh, gaze, or perhaps Bela Lugosi in the, in the vampire, right? So here is an obvious, you know, bombastic, lurid production of Anglo-American demonic propaganda. And you're supposed to believe that this guy seized controls of the airplane and flew Flight 11 into the North Tower. And we have this collection of patsies. Uh, this one in particular, Hani Hanjur, is one of uh, consummate ineptitude, a basket case in the true sense. Uh, Jara 
probably a little bit better off, especially since there were at least two of him, uh, and so on through the, through the entire list. Now, uh, we have some <laughs> problems believing this, of course, because the same intelligence establishment that is so emphatic that they know who the hijackers were, just a few months later, had to admit that they were all wrong about Iraq. The problem, if, if you believe any of the Bush uh, stuff, if you believe the official version, you essentially argue, as, the, as these left liberals do, Bush was a liar until September 11th. Then he was transmogrified into a teller of truth for several months, but then by the State of the Union of 2002 in January, he started telling lies again because he wanted to go to Iraq. So I think it's a, it's a bit of a stretch. Now, the way that I look at all this is summed up in these, uh, this conceptual diagram, which I commend to your attention. You have patsies, you have moles, you have professional uh, killers. The patsies are the ones that you see, the ones we've just been seeing, Bin Laden, Atta, we're going to see Musawi in a minute, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, useful idiots, fanatics, police agents, double agents, provocateurs, Oswalds. And Oswald said, it. I'm just a patsy. These are the people who uh, take the fall. They are scapegoated and, and destroyed. They are supported before the terrorist action by the moles, the government officials loyal to a private network, people like David Frasca of the FBI, who gets the Minneapolis report and the Phoenix report and proceeds to sit on them and to do nothing. And a guy called um, uh, Ro Rosintel, I think his name is, who was his boss, who appeared in Alexandria, Virginia, at the Musawi trial a couple of days ago. So they're loyal to the private network. And then we have the others, the professional killers, are the people who do have the physical, technical ability to bring about the effects observed. The patsies can have all kinds of criminal intent, and I would not deny that. They are criminally insane in many cases and would love to kill large numbers of people. The problem is that they don't have the physical, technical equipment to do it, but the professional killers do. These are the technicians, CIA, old boys, special forces, the so-called asteroids, the Iran-Contra networks as they evolved into the 90s and into the, into the aughties. And these people also have the ability that since they're old boys with security clearances and friends, they can take part in using government resources for the crimes. They can help to conduit the actions through the government. So these, again, the patsies, not able to do what they're supposed to do. Even the so-called, I think the average weight of a muscle hijacker was about 150 pounds, and they're going up against these huge football player types who are the military uh, veteran pilots of these airplanes. The entire story is, is completely fantastic. I wanted to bring some stuff up to date, in particular about able danger. Remember that Atta was reported in Newsweek magazine to be a double agent, trained and housed at U.S. military bases. People in Florida say he looked like a double agent. Now, the double agents are run by case officers. They have to report back to case officers and terrorist controllers in the military intelligence bureaucracy on what they're doing. And the problem is, how do you make sure they're doing what they tell you they're doing? How do you check up on a double agent? In other words, if I'm a case officer running a double agent, how do I make sure if you said that you did something, that you actually did it? Well, one way is electronic eavesdropping, and I think that's the key to able danger, the story that broke last August. And let's just try to run through this. Let me um, say also, my slides are probably too detailed, and I realize sometimes the, uh, the headline is really the, uh, the punchline or the top line, don't worry about the rest. The rest is often documentation. If you'd like to get the entire set, once again, please apply to the organizers, and they'll give it to you for a, uh, a modest uh, contribution. So Able Danger comes in 1999. Right? This was a big flap last, last summer, founded by Shelton and by Shoemaker, who is now the top military officer of the United States. At that time, he was the boss of the Special Forces Command. The Special Forces Command is one of the groups you want to watch out for because those are people who engage in terrorism, quite frankly. Uh, and here's his story. He was at Desert One. Uh, and you had contractors. It's a large data mining operation, and it's got all kinds of connections inside the Pentagon. And my thesis is simply this, that Able Danger are the terror bosses. They are the terrorist controllers. 
their uh, bases, uh, various Air Force facilities. According to Congressman Weldon, a strange maverick Republican who seems to think he's doing something for his own party, uh, he said on August 12th of last year that Able Danger had been tasked to manipulate, degrade, or destroy terrorist groups. Now, as soon as you say manipulate, you're a terrorist controller because you're telling terrorists what to do. And once you say, once manipulate is in your charter, you have a license to do whatever you want. And that's what they did. So these are terrorist controllers, case officers, and babysitters for ATA. And we have this interesting story that the intelligence boss of the Special Forces Command, Jeffrey Lambert, has basically that same bunch of mugshots of the uh, so-called hijackers. And he's got yellow post-it notes on the faces of people like Atta saying, off limits, you're not allowed to tell the FBI about these people. So it's the typical thing that moles protect the patsies until the crime is done. Not because the patsies can carry out the crime, but because if the patsies are all sitting in jail, you can't scapegoat them as the authors of the crime. You need the patsies to be free. And with that, a whole area of 9-11 research is simply cleared up. Now, there's also a question of dates. When was Atta, when were Atta and company in the U.S.? They, they were in the U.S. January, February 2000. This overthrows the official version. The Kane Hamilton Commission goes out the window. And it turns out, according to Knight Ritter, that NSA was monitoring and translating Atta's calls in the United States, presumably around this time, early 2000. So they, they know everything these people are doing. I also wanted to re use this to point your attention to an interesting British book that has come out, 9-11 Revealed, The Unanswered Questions. It's probably the book that has the best pictures or one of the best picture books on the, uh, on the subject. And these guys deserve a little bit more attention than they've been getting, even if they are a kind of robust lie hop. There might have been multiple able dangers. They might have had others. This guy Schaefer is one of the so-called whistleblowers, former terrorist controller and whistleblowers. There might have been several able dangers. In other words, several groups monitoring stables of patsies and terrorists. So they say that uh, they knew that Atta and some other patsies were living in New York City, in Bronx and Brooklyn in early 2000, and then in Wayne, New Jersey. Now this begins to raise problems of the same people being reported in two places at the same time. Now even, even an experienced patsy can only be in a limited number of places at the same time. <laughs> I think you'll agree. Uh, and of course, the Pentagon lawyers say you can't tell the FBI, typical. And the interesting thing is that when these people from Able Danger went to the boss of the Kane Hamilton Commission, the infamous Philip Zelikow, and said to him, here, we're intelligence DIA colonels and, and Navy captains, and we're telling you that we did these things, Zelikow said, it's not historically significant. So again, if you want proof that the Kane Hamilton Commission is just a tissue of lies. Here it is. Throw out the Kane Hamilton Commission. It's not worth the, the uh, paper that it's printed on. Right? It, they might make it into the Book of the Month Club in the uh, fiction category, as has been observed. <laughs> Weldon says that he has a flowchart with all kinds of names, including Atta, and that he gave it to Hadley uh, soon after the attacks, uh, but it disappeared, the usual stuff. And the really interesting one is Two and a half terabytes of data. That's, that's even longer than my speech. <laughs> Two and a half terabytes of data. It's one quarter of the Library of Congress that was destroyed in May, June of 2000, and other data destroyed in 2001, and most interesting, in spring of 2004. And here's who did it. It was ordered by the Army Intelligence and Security Command General Counsel, Tony Gentry. Now, why hasn't this guy been hauled in front of, a, of, a, uh, of an investigating committee? Why hasn't he been indicted? This is all illegal. I would submit that these are the records, the two and a half terabytes, the one quarter of the Library of Congress, is the records of their spying on the patsies and knowing everything about them. So they've got to deep six all of that data. The other thing is this. Able Warrior is the name of a series of drills. And as you'll see now, we're going to veer more and more 
as my talk goes on, oy vey, uh, into the, uh, the world of these Pentagon code names and so forth. And uh, one of them is uh, Able Warrior. It's usually the biggest yearly drill of the Special Forces Command, and it's defending against terror, anti war on terror. Remember, the drills come in binary pairs. There's an attacker and a defender. My thesis is Able Danger starts as a troop. The, the legal justification is these guys are a troop or a stable of actors who pretend to attack in the context of a drill like Able Warrior except at a certain point, as so often happens with the drills, somebody decides to flip it live. And the actors become the protagonists of something much bigger. And then within, <laughs> since we've had lie hop and my hop, there's door hop. <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding. This seems to be a secret cell inside Able Danger, which may be the repository of things that are much, much more damning than the simple able danger. Uh, it was mentioned by Congressman Weldon in his press conference last uh, summer. Rumsfeld immediately said nobody from able danger was allowed to testify before Congress, although some of them did show up a, a little bit later. Now here are the drills. I want, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to do a quick overview of something like what Barry did on, on some of the key points of the official version, but I want you to remember that 9-11 is the day of the drills. Look at them all, 15 plus and counting. Air defense drills, some of them amalgam warrior. Um, I don't know which, which are most important at this point, really. Global Guardian is the big nuclear one. I would point to that. The National Reconnaissance Office, as we'll see, is crashing planes into buildings, the likely vehicle for crashing planes into buildings through that. Uh, AWACS and uh, quite a number of others. We'll get back to them. So it means that we have to look more and more, here's Wolfowitz and uh, the rest you know, more and more into these circles because uh, it is increasingly impossible for many of them not to have been witting, willing participants in what amounts to a coup against the, uh, the Constitution. Now the physical impossibility of the official version is always a good horse in an argument. Could the, the Patsies fly the planes? And if they couldn't, who could? Well, you have bin Laden, uh, a, an eccentric. And nobody accused him of flying a plane, but he's an eccentric. He's, he's uh, somebody who's notoriously a dreamer, uh, not practical, has to be told what to do, has to get kidney dialysis from the CIA, has to get legal advice from the State Department has to get visas from the State Department, has to get a personal assistant, Sergeant Muhammad Ali from the U.S. Special Forces of Fort Bragg. They send him a special personal assistant. And uh, his fan club is in Langley, Virginia. You can read the Michael Scheuer book, Imperial Hubris, where the CIA says he's the greatest political operative of the 21st century. He's the Abraham Lincoln of the Arabs. Unbelievable. Our dear friend we know. And now we have Musawi. This wretched man is on trial in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, he says that he was going to fly a 747 into the White House with the help of Richard Reed that we're going to see in a minute. There he is. <laughs> these, these wretched individuals, these, these are, are pieces of human wreckage. Uh, these, these people ought to be in, in, in an asylum for the, for the criminally insane. Uh, he argued for, two, for three and a half years that he was not a part of 9-11. Early last week on Monday, he said, guess what? I was a part of 9-11. I was going to fly the 747 into the White House with the friend of my, my, with the help of my intrepid friend, the shoe bomber. He later on went to become the shoe bomber. I urge you to laugh at this because it is absurd to the point of tearing your hair out. Except the, the one guy I think is going to die now. The, the um, defense tried to say, wait a minute. Musawi is just making this up and what they did was they sent the CIA to all of these people that are in the secret prisons apparently uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin Al Shib and said what do you think of Musawi and they said well he's a megalomaniac, he's a dreamer he makes things up, he brags, he boasts we didn't have anything to do with him, we wouldn't have used him and on and on so this is the quality of Patsy that they come up with. Patsy 
50, 60 percent. Double agent, 30, 40. And of course, Reed was a wretched homeless man who ended up sleeping, and this is where they come together, in Finsbury Mosque and Brixton Mosque in London, which is where British intelligence, MI5, MI6, runs their operation to recruit these sorts of people. Therefore, in my book, I know I have uh, radical critics who don't like me even saying these things, but in my book, I can't hide it. It's still there. You can read it for yourself. I argue that the simplest, most economical way of having the planes crash into the buildings is this global hawk, right? Here's the Air Force technology. It's well known. Either you build that technology into a commercial airliner or you use something like this and fly that in, right? Because it looks about the same, right? Paint some some holes on the side and it's going to look pretty much like an airplane. The other big question, why no air defense for one hour and 45 minutes? I would say, obvious, moles at work in the US Air Force and NORAD. The stand down order is clearly there. What else could it be? Whether you find it in writing or not is a different story. Where were the F-16s for one hour and 45 to one hour and 50 minutes? Remember that the Cold War window was something like 10 to 15 minutes. And then we get into the question of controlled demolition. Barry has addressed this. You look at this and you'd say, this is controlled demolition, but it's controlled demolition of a very, very overpowering extreme form. It's the building being pulverized, vaporized in midair, and then falling at the speed of gravity, collapsing onto its own base. And look at this debris being thrown out, huge chunks of the building being thrown out 100 yards or more in various directions, even including upward. How could a pancake collapse ever engender this? And I, so you see how much Barry and I agree. We even show the same slides of the building in Los Angeles. It burned lustily for a long time. Same thing with Caracas, Madrid, and so forth. No modern fireproof steel reinforced skyscraper has ever fallen down as a result of fires, except the three on 9-11 in New York City. And again, those central columns, I mean, the, the, the strength, uh, the, the, the power of these columns, this is a steel architecture that is equal to that of the biggest suspension bridges in the world. It's like the superstructure of a battleship. This, the, the walls of those columns are four inches thick down at the bottom where they're holding up the entire building. And you're expected to see that these things were cut like pieces of spaghetti into 25-yard lengths so they could simply be put on large trucks and sent off to fresh kills on Staten Island under the guardianship of Rudy Giuliani, the destroyer of the crime scene. Uh, notice also that the effect of these steel structures is to act as a radiator, to conduit heat away from the fire, including the outside ones, right? Steel takes the heat and sends it off and dissipates it. There is no way. And if, uh, even if the floors had pancaked, this central structure would have been left standing or at most would have fallen over like a tree. So this notion of falling into the base of the building is simply impossible. And we even have all kinds of interesting proof. NBC News film, here's the black smoke from the fire. It's not a very hot fire. And we have a line of white squibs of smoke. Explosions, and we see that this is then, the smoke dissipates and then it's repeated and it seems to follow the line of the collapse as it goes down. The smoke gets bigger, the building collapses further. And notice that the length of this is about two-thirds of the facade of the building. That corresponds to the presence of the columns in there. They are about two-thirds of the length of the building. And then you get that kind of a result. The problem here again is what kind of explosives could have done it? On my radio program a week ago today, we had uh, Dr. Jeff King, who argues that these were shaped charges. There's another body of opinion that says even shaped charges would not be enough. And we have to have recourse to some notion of nanotechnology, nano explosives, things that I am just beginning to look into, but the, the, the research is in flux on this point as well. Some have even gone so far as to say we may be dealing with new physical principles. The problem with the new physical principles would be lasers or something like this. The problem with that is what would the source of power be and nobody seems to know what it might be. Building 7, as Barry has pointed out, the reductio ad absurdum of the entire story, not hit by a plane, no significant fire, falls down into its own base, 
at 5.30 in the afternoon. And I was watching all this from Berlin, Germany, and the German television said, we've been told that it's going to fall down. And that was about 10 or 15 minutes before the building collapsed. How could they know? How could Giuliani know? And here's what it looks like. You can see this is, this is something you can't do in, in an hour if Silverstein <laughs> gives this order. It's a fantastic story. And they, there, it raises many, many more questions than it, than it answers. It, it destroys the official version, but it makes you wonder how this thing was planned. I mean, was, was Building 7 something, is, is it a fragment of some operation that was supposed to happen that didn't happen? Anyway, the idea is you put in many small charges in the static structure of the building and, and blow them up with a, with a computer. Here's the whole thing seen from above. Here's uh, the South Tower, I guess. The North Tower is over here. Building 7 is over here. And you notice there are buildings between 7 and the rest that are less destroyed than 7. Here's 6. Look at this, a huge crater in the roof, which probably is not explic explicable through debris falling. And something similar over here. And here is this question of the molten metal that remains in pools in the sub-basement and continues to be molten for weeks on end. Again, what is the power source that could have produced that? This is where the problem of conventional explosives seems to break down and we have to look for something more exotic. Well, the Pentagon, Barry had this. You saw it subliminally, he, he put this on. Uh, the problem with the Pentagon is that the hole in the side of the building is simply far too small, given the way the plane comes in. <laughs> you have to assume that Hani Hanjur, the misfit that we saw, the guy who couldn't pass the Cessna test, was able to bring the airplane again. This is you know, coming down 8,000 feet in a couple of minutes with a 270 degree turn and then coming in at you know, one centimeter off the grass. The other problem is that there are, there are light poles and big industrial spools on this lawn. So this would have been impossible. And the most damning, this is the same thing. This is Thierry Maison's work. Remember, this is the French expert who uh, came out with this before anybody else in the world. I guess I've got a bad slide. but. This is the hole in the building. I, I have to caveat this one. This is the hole in the building after the facade collapsed. It's 19 meters across when it collapsed. The plane is 38 meters across. The hole is too small, but the original hole is even smaller. There's the original hole. This is one of the first pictures made of the Pentagon after the impact. That's the hole in the wall, and that is too small for a Boeing. Right? I'm sure everybody here can intuit everything. Yeah. No, what it was, uh, the, the media liked to show the front after the facade collapsed. Again, this is still too small for a Boeing, although it's bigger. And here we have Ashcroft, of course. And the, the other problem is that the wreckage, there's no wreckage of a commercial airliner here. There are these little pieces, fragments. This could easily have been planted. And then they come out with rotors that look like they could have come off a lawnmower and say that's what's left of the commercial airliner. I think something like a cruise missile is, is more likely. And there's even a school of thought that says it's explosives in the building. And that's, I guess even that is possible at the outside. Now Shanksville poses similar issues. Here you don't find a commercial airliner intact. You find this hole the assertion is that the airliner went into the hole and that there's a, an, a, an abandoned coal mine underneath. <laughs> I'm serious. I guess you're... Uh, but then, of course, if there is, well, then bring it up. But they don't do that. They don't bring up the wreckage. The other problem is the wreckage is thrown over 10 miles in a very calm day. It looks like whatever there was here, was this a commercial airliner? Again, it's very hard to say. Whatever it was seems to have exploded in the air or been shot down from, from a higher altitude. And here, one, the, the hypothesis that I still give in the book, which I guess I have to revise maybe sometime soon, is that if there was an attempt of the passengers to take over the plane, in spite of Global Hawk, that uh, the decision might have been made to destroy the plane to make sure that, a, that an intact plane would not land, because the intact plane would either have hijackers or no hijackers, and it would have perhaps Global Hawk, and that might come to light. 
And then we have Angel is Next. And I think, uh, I diverge with most people in saying that I think this is the single most important piece of evidence of the entire day. This is the rogue network speaking. These are the coup faction saying what they want. And they're saying this to Bush. It is Bush, you are confronted with a fait accompli. Do what we say, become our puppet, become our spokesman and, and front man, or you're expendable and that will be the end of you. And the angel, of, angel is next doesn't just come in with that. It comes in with a string of top secret cosmic code words implying that those who are making the threat have access to nuclear launch codes. And I have interpreted, therefore, this to mean either you launch the war of civilizations in conventional form in Afghanistan and later in Iraq, or we will launch, we the invisible government, the rogue network, we will launch the war of civilizations using these nuclear launch codes against Amman, Damascus, Baghdad, Cairo, Tehran, any place. And that, of course, raises the question of Russian and Chinese response, because any launch of nuclear missiles leads everybody to go to a possible launch on warning and a possible immediate response. So this is the threat of assassination and coup. Uh, there is evidence I show from Hopsicker and some others that there's a kind of a half-hearted assassination attempt against Bush in the morning. There's a half-hearted defense against it, but that seems to be enough to push the, the uh, possible perpetrators back. Nobody takes them into custody. It's very strange. Uh, did they want Cheney as president? Maybe they did. And then there's, this came up, I think, on, on a broadcast today. Buffett and, uh, and Scowcroft were both converging at this Nebraska Air Force Base, off foot, with a STRATCOM. Was that going to be a committee of public safety? In other words, maybe Bush and Cheney both were uh, expendable. They certainly were and that this was going to be the nucleus of a new government. I really don't know. These things are, are strange. Now we have this uh, <laughs> moment, and uh, Barry and I have an ongoing debate about this. What, what, what is this man thinking? Um, he says to the, to the Kane Hamilton Commission, I sat there to project power and strength. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my point of view is, this cruel and stupid little man is so much of an insignificant moron that nobody would confide in him any details of such an important plan. He is simply not important enough. I could argue, I could go through the modern presidency starting with Harry S. Truman to argue that the modern American presidency is a puppet position the vice presidency equally so. Cheney is a puppet. Uh, if you just look at what the newspapers tell you, Bush and Cheney are demonstrably somehow dépendants of George Schultz, of the Hoover Institution and the Bohemian Grove and, and everything else, uh, who chose them and who chose the Vulcans, chose Wolfowitz, Condoleezza Rice, and so forth. And I get the idea here that he is now confronted with the fact that uh, he's been told the day before get ready for a big day and make sure that you follow orders very precisely or things could get really bad really fast. I think he's being security stripped. He shouldn't be here. Uh, the, the Secret Service is supposed to get him out of there. One of them said, we're out of here, and then nothing was done. So he's there and he's being held out as a target. You know, you want to have a go at him? Have a go. He's expendable. I don't think there's any, any guarantee that he's not a target. He certainly could be. Why not? Again, he's just not that important. I don't think anybody sets up a TV set for him so that he can see a building being hit by a plane. He'll have to watch it on the evening news with the rest of us, I'm sure. Um, so I think that he is, he's the target of this ultimatum. Again, he's been presented with a fait accompli. What's he going to do? Well, he's going to become the, the, the spokesman. He's essentially going to capitulate to the powers that have now emerged in the invisible government above him and behind him. And that's what he's going to do. When he takes off with Air Force One, he has no fighter escort, and he's getting reports that planes are heading to shoot him down. That's, I'm very proud of my chapter, Angel is Next, and I commend it to your to your attention. Uh, something similar, May 5th last year, airplane approaches the White House 
Red alert at the White House. All the, the uh, correspondents run out of the building. Congress panic as they evacuate the Congress. And he is not told. They don't tell him. Because <laughs> he's out, he's over in Greenbelt, Maryland, near where I live, riding his bike. And he is never told. Now you tell me if that's the dictator of the United States or a puppet. I think to ask the question again is, is to answer it. Um, obviously he, he needs to invoke 9-11 all the time. Our answer to that, as Phil Berg has said, is get a 9-11 deep throat, as he put this forward in Brussels last, uh, last November. Bush's explanation for everything is 9-11. If you've seen the Doonesbury, you can use 9-11 now in your personal life. Um, you see the defeated football player coming off the field saying, Coach, I don't know what happened to us. It must have been 9-11. <laughs> well, the husband, the husband is caught in bed with his girlfriend by his wife and says, Honey, it was 9-11. <laughs> Bush has given an example of using 9-11 literally for everything. Um, There's another interesting question. Why does Bush not go to the FISA court to get a warrant? for these wiretaps. What's the problem? Everybody knows the FISA court is a bunch of puppets of the regime. Um, my saying is they would put a wiretap on a ham sandwich if the government <laughs> asked them to. But he refuses to do it. And I would say the reason is that he doesn't want these judges who do represent you know, a different group. It's not his group. Or, again, it's not the invisible government's group, I guess is a better way to put it. Doesn't want them seeing that there are uh, intercepts that have to do with pre-9-11 and post-9-11 terror activity, like Madrid or London or, or things that are, that are still coming up. I think this is the reason why he doesn't want to have judges look at it. And he makes this otherwise inexplicable assertion that he can do it without anybody else. I also wanted to point out, this is also something new. Um, this comes from the Washington Post just before Christmas. Remember the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which we just saw. Uh, here's the uh, new Gulf of Tonkin resolution of September 14, 2001. Bush wanted authorization to use military force to, this is sweeping, to deter and preempt any future acts of terrorism or aggression against the United States. It's a declaration of war against the planet Earth. But they saw, the senators, thank God, said this was too broad. The Congress said, we'll give you necessary and appropriate force against nations, organizations, or persons, the president determined, planned, authorized, committed, or aided the 9-11 attacks. Just before the vote, Bush came back with this. Congress should authorize all necessary and appropriate force in the United States and against those nations, organizations, or persons he determined, planned, authorized, and so forth. Now, Use of force inside the United States looks to me like civil war. And it looks like Bush was looking for um, a kind of a carte blanche to wage civil war inside the country. What could it be? Does he want to attack an opposing faction? Or does he think an opposing faction is going to attack him? What is, what is this? I think this is another thing that has to be very thoroughly investigated because it, it adds up. This is Senator Daschle telling the story. He's, he's trying to argue, we never uh, authorized those FISA-less uh, you know, wiretaps. But he's told us much more, as often happens in historical documents. Now, very briefly, I'm, I'm never going to get to the end of this today. But uh, we have the official version. We've seen it. Tissue of lies. OK, there it is. We've got it. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, the official version with unanswered questions, Nafiz Ahmed. We have the official version, and you deserve it. The official version with a vengeance, because you're an imperialist. That's really Ward Churchill of the Weathermen. But Noam Chomsky, with a capital G on the Noam, uh, also <laughs> verges into this kind of, of uh, stuff. This is the left liberal school. LIHOP, let it happen on purpose. This, I would say, uh, Mike Ruppert's book is the most voluminous attempt to show that it was Lihop and that Cheney is the key person. This Lihop Forte, as it's been known, is Ian Henschel's book with the, with the good pictures that I mentioned before. In the case of Myhop, we have 
what I guess you could call Bush Cheney my hop, although with certain uh, limits coming from David Ray Griffin. We have in this book, these books, we have individual details tend to be resolved in the direction of my hop. But there is no overall thesis, as David Ray Griffin seems to repeat last time I heard him last August, that he has no overall theory of what happened on 9-11. Uh, in contrast, I try to offer this. And then we have what I guess you could call U.S. secret government MIHOP, which would be Maison of France, von Bülow and Wisniewski of Germany, Blondet of Italy, Tarpley, and I think probably Hofschmidt gets into this one. We've also got something I'd have to call Mossad MIHOP. The Mossad made it happen on purpose. I think Chris Bolin of American Free Press goes pretty far in this direction. I would warn against... Um, this one in particular. Uh, there's lots and lots of evidence that the Mossad watched everything and knew everything. But as far as I can see, there is no proof of an actual operative role of the Mossad making it happen. This is not the question of whether the Mossad is bad. The Mossad is very bad. It's not whether you like Sharon or whoever we have, Netanyahu, or he's gone too, so uh, whoever you have. But the problem is if you want to implicate the Mossad in my hub, you've got to have some proof. And as far as I can see, there's no proof. Dancing on a, on, a, on a roof and celebrating and filming it is not making it happen. And you have to be very careful what you get into in these regards. Here's Andreas von Bülow. I just had the honor of talking to him on my radio show this afternoon. If you missed it, tune in. You can go to RBN, that is Republic Broadcasting Network on the Internet, and you'll find the entire thing archived. And you can see what he calls it, the CIA and the 11th of September, international terror and the role of the secret intelligence agency. His my hop goes like this. He says, the US government is covering up everything. They say it was the Arabs who did it, but they cover up and they lie and they suppress evidence. If the Arabs had really done it, they'd publish all the evidence. They'd take all those FBI surveillance cameras and all the rest of that stuff and put it out. The fact that they don't do it indicates that they did it. That's one path to my hop, and I think a very convincing one for many people. Maison with Pentagate, again, his thesis is the military coup by a secret government with the Bush people not knowing what to do until the end of the day when Bush came out with the um, War of Civilizations. And my good friend Gerhard Wisniewski, Operation 9-11, Attack on the Globe. This one is also my hop. It's significant that the Europeans generally are my hop from the word go, and it's taken a significant time for conditions in this country to reach something similar. He was my guest in my first program. You can see an you can look at an uh, hear an archived interview with him on uh, on RBN Live. This is my old friend Maurizio Blondet. Known him for 35 years now. He's a conservative Catholic in Milan. This is called 11th of September, coup d'etat in the United States. And again, the general direction here also is my hop. Well, you have, a, you have some evidence that points to lie hop, of course, but I think the important thing is the difference. Uh, lie hop assumes that Al-Qaeda bin Laden have an independent existence and an independent will and that they have the physical technical ability to produce the results observed. So the government officials are simply accessories to a crime committed by others. My hub says no, the Patsies don't have that ability, the government officials are the perpetrators. And I think this is, this is increasingly standing up. Then there's a lot of evidence that goes only in the direction of my hub. Global Hawk, if that works, the controlled demolition, the pull it, the problems and anomalies of what hit the Twin Towers, because that's an issue too. The lack of a commercial airplane at the Pentagon, the Shanksville problems, and I say, above all, Angel is next. The secret government talks. Notice that MIHOP includes LIHOP. The task of the FBI typically is LIHOP, right? Making sure that nobody arrests the patsies. But uh, that is, it's, it's a little bit different than most people might, might look at it. Now, in the remaining, 20 minutes that I have, let's just look at the role of drills and exercises. Drills, maneuvers, war games, exercises, and simulations, because I think this is the most interesting and fruitful area of research right now. You have some exercises are just in the command post, some are war games with real tanks or troops, and then you have terror drills, civil defense, FEMA, 
whatever that is. Now, the classical use of a drill is to deceive. You deceive the enemy, right? You say, Fridonia announces its summer maneuvers along the border with Slobovia. Our 10 divisions are only doing their normal summer drill. But once they get there, they attack. So if you use the drill to cover the mobilization. You can also use the drill to deceive your own side, the coup d'etat. Remember, need to know compartmentalization. A loyal officer sitting at a console next to him, a treasonous officer who's part of the coup. The loyal officer looks over and he says, oh, flying planes into buildings, is it today? What's that? And he says, well, that's, uh, that's Amalgam Virgo, and you don't have a clearance to know about Amalgam Virgo. So you can conduit your operation through a military bureaucracy where not everybody is necessarily on your side. You don't want them to know. They might oppose you. So the adjacent consoles. The drill is typically used as a cover for a coup, an assassination, a war, or some other provocation. Remember what a coup d'etat is. One part of the government attacks the other parts, and it's got to be secret. Typically, they use dupes and fanatics. Um, the classic one is a dupe is recruited into an exercise which turns into an actual terror attack. And the ghostly objectivity that I, I like to write about is at one level, one person looks at the operation and thinks it's a drill. Another person looks at it and knows that it's an actual terror action where people are going to die. Now, my friend Nico Haupt, the, the well-known enfant terrible of 9-11 studies, uh, but somebody who, you know, he's... He's maybe not the one you want at a dinner party, but if you need some new ideas, uh, he's often your man. <coughs> he goes from the lowest level to the highest. He says, we have toys, our dupes, who don't even know they're in a drill. We have te team players or extras who think they're in a drill. It's not a drill. Supervisors, coordinators, and consultants, some of them think they're in a drill. Some of them know it's a real attack. Passive plotters are sort of the middle management. They know, but they can be eliminated. Uh, and again, 9-11 is the day of dupes. If you've been told to look for the means, the motive, and the opportunity, that won't do it. It can't be means, motive, and opportunity, because when intelligence agencies are involved, the motive of the individual has nothing to do with what's happening, because he's a dupe, and he's in, inside something that's much bigger. The means, well, the Richard, the shoe bomber, has no means, but behind him is the power of the CIA. So he acquires means that you can't see. This is one of the reasons that terrorists routinely run circles around police officers and normal cops. The normal cop can't deal with the fact that an intelligence agency is, is on the march. So the regime. Now, if you want to learn about drills, there's William Arkin. He does controlled hangouts. But you've got to get this big book that's like an encyclopedia of all the drills. Here's the concept. If you want to conduit a terror operation through the military security bureaucracy, make sure that it coincides with an exercise or drill that closely resembles the terror operation. There you can camouflage your criminal intent. You let the terror action be staged through a series of minor departures from the scenario. And you're always going back between simulation and reality. Mongoose, supposedly assassinate Fidel, in reality a cover for the operations against Kennedy, I think most researchers would admit. This is one of my favorites, Hilex 75. It was an attempt after the rout in Saigon. There were people who thought that the US and the British might collapse worldwide. Could have happened. They, they believed the domino theory on a big scale. And they said, let's have high-level high exercise 75, simulated confrontation with top officials, the idea being to start it as a drill and then flip it live and go for a confrontation with the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact. There was a leak in Der Spiegel, and uh, I spent Christmas Eve 1975 on the steps of the Milan Cathedral handing out leaflets saying, stop Helix 75, Helix 75 means the Third World War. And I want to point this out to you because citizens can stop them. The whole point of drills, right, to know about drills is that you can stop them. And we'll have some, some even more recent examples. Here's a good one, Able Archer 83, U.S. nuclear war drill. 
so realistic that the Soviets thought it was the real attack. They went to red alert and the world was on the verge, right? This was the Euro missiles crisis of the fall of that year. Here's a good one, 7-7 in London. We have three drills, Atlantic Blue of the British, top off three of the US, triple play of Canada. Their scenario, bombs in the London underground at the time of an international conference, which turned out to be the Glen Eagle Scotland meeting of the group of eight. Visor Associates with Peter Power was simulating bombs in the underground at the places and times of the actual explosions, according to BBC Five. And to top it all off, the Scotland Yard knew and told Netanyahu. Now some of my friends at the, well, some, some people in the American Free Press says, that proves that Netanyahu is a villain. Well, sure he's a villain, but this proves that Scotland Yard is a villain, because they knew and they told him Right? Don't be so blinded by Netanyahu that you missed the point. It's that Scotland Yard knew in advance that there was going to be an attack. So these drills and this operation, this was the long-term preparation, and this was the immediate vehicle of these bombs going off in the London subway. So here we have the, the 15. We're going to have to take short shrift on some of these. Again, if you want the slideshow, you can have it. I would say, if you look at 9-11, I can't say that all aspects were covered by war drills and terror drills, but many were. The majority, some of the most spectacular. So these were the vehicles. Here's Vigilant Guardian. This includes a simulated hijacked plane heading for Kennedy Airport. The idea here is multiply the targets and diminish the defense assets. Vigilant Warrior. It's not a pretty picture, Dick says uh, uh, General Myers to Richard Clark. This is a pretty mysterious one. Northern Vigilance takes all the aircraft and sends them up towards the North Pole. It also injects fake blip blips into radar screens. Northern Guardian is another one. As a result of this, on the morning of 9-11, we get up to 29 aircraft reported as hijacked. Some of them are obviously parts of these drills or fake blips. This one is real. <laughs> Drill real. This is a real defense against Russia with six planes from the Virginia area sent to Iceland. Very strange little country, right? Seized by the U.S. in 1941 and the U.S. has never left. Northern Watch. This is the no-fly zone over northern Iraq. It's not just assets in Iraq that could have helped Katrina. They could have helped on 9-11, but they were flying the illegal unilateral no-fly zone in northern Iraq. And we also have this one, that six days before the actions, the U.S. Army bases go into a lockdown, full access control, especially at Fort Myer and Fort McNair, which are right near Washington. If you want to have a coup, you've got to have those troops there. Amalgam Warrior, this is air defense and air attack going on. We've also got the closure of Air Force bases, some long-term structural tendencies, some aircraft that are sent away. Crown vigilance, again, a lot of this remains to be explored. Apollo Guardian, another one going on on 9-11. And then we have the AWACS, these flying command posts that would be key, I think, in some kind of change of power. Uh, Larry Arnold, this Air Force general, takes two AWACS. He sends one of them to the coast of Florida and one of them to the Washington, D.C. area. So Bush is down here in Florida, and Washington, D.C. is the government, and he's got an AWACS covering each one. I think that looks like a coup. Fort Myer, Virginia, they have a special course for the fire. We're going to get to the Pentagon in three minutes. So they've been well prepared. And again, you're always wondering, a small, loyal unit needed for a military coup. Was that the one? Same thing at Fort Belvoir, a little bit further away. We've got a CIA, FBI contingent from the anti-terror force that are taking a training exercise in Monterey, California. So that takes them out of the immediate picture. We've got this <coughs> drill of biochemical attack with Giuliani, as he writes in his self-serving book, Leadership, <laughs> the tabletop biological warfare drill going on the day of. We've got a New York area uh, attack drill. In the previous 
edition of this, a real bomb threat arrived during the drill, but it turned out to be a training aid. A little bit later, a real bomb threat arrived and turned out to be the real 9-11. So you can see the general ideas raised by these, uh, these drills, but let's just move on to the, this is one of the big ones. Amalgam Virgo 01, multiple simultaneous hijackings. But notice, a third world uninhabited aerial vehicle or cruise missile launched off a rogue freighter in the Gulf of Mexico or barge in the Atlantic. Now that looks very much like a cruise missile hitting the Pentagon. That is my working hypothesis on that one. And it involves the use of an NQM-107 drone, which is something like a cruise missile. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture. Another one is planned for July 2001. Simula I think this is actually 2002. Simulated hijacks of planes coming from Utah and Washington going to British Columbia and Alaska. And I think that's my hop. And it's going to include, it's 2002, a Delta with real Delta pilots, actors, well, who are the actors going to be? Are they going to be from the Screen Actors Guild or are they going to be from the, from the, no seriously, are they going to be from the, you know, from Able Danger? They're posing as passengers and it's going to be hijacked by FBI agents posing as terrorists. Now you can see when you have multiple levels of deception going into the same plane, how easy it is to turn that into something completely different if you have to. The FBI told Seymour Hersh that they were constantly simulating terrorist attacks before 9-11, including scenarios involving multiple plane hijackings. And some of them were apparently quite similar to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Well, they're preparing them, and they prepare, and they prepare, and then they flip it live, and it's real. There's even a drill in Shanksville, a special preparation for the first responders in that area. And it seems to be the idea that one of their main issues is to cordon off the site and make sure that nobody gets in. Perhaps the most damning of them all is the National Reconnaissance Office planes hitting buildings. Headline, top U.S. intelligence agency was to simulate plane crash into building on September 11th. Chantilly, Virginia, emergency response. Now this is the agency, it's a kind of a co-production of all the other spook agencies. They have the satellites, so they can see where all the planes are at any given time using their satellite imaging. You've got Booz Allen Hamilton involved. And I would submit that when it looks like planes into buildings, it means planes into buildings. And that this is not a drill, but this is the real thing. And you can see that NORAD had its own planes into buildings, including the World Trade Center, using numerous types of civilian and military aircraft, including hijacks coming from abroad. So the whole thing has been nilled. You think about Condoleezza Rice. Nobody ever thought. <laughs> the Pentagon, 2000. Burning model airplane used at the Pentagon. Commercial airliner hits Pentagon. Uh, another one planned but called off. Medics train for a Boeing 757 hitting the Pentagon. Uh, mass casualty exercise plane hitting building. So, it's just going on all the time. Richard Clark, Richard Clark, one of the top bureaucrats of this entire thing, has a drill of a plane crashing into the White House in 1998. A Learjet packed with explosives was his uh, version. Now, this is the face of the invisible government. He, he won the, the Academy Award for acting at those uh, hearings, the government failed you. This was not a failure. This was exactly the project of the invisible government that this man represents. If you have martial law, you'll find him in a very, very prominent position. He ran the government on 9-11. Chemical weapons drills. Now, the last one, and I guess I'm going to have to end with this. On the cover of my book, why the mushroom cloud? Why not buildings collapsing? This is the aspect of what might have been and it's Global Guardian, and it tells us that on the morning of 9-11, we had an Armageddon exercise going on, thermonuclear war fighting, called Global Guardian. And it means Cuban Missile Crisis, Red Alert, B-52s, B-1s, and all kinds of missiles. Headquarters is at Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, you've got the doomsday apparatus, the so-called night watch or looking glass aircraft, the flying command centers that are supposed to stay up there for a week or 10 days in case of nuclear war. It is a full Cold War confrontation posture before any hijackings involving these 
important Air Force bases. Notice that two of them are the destinations of Bush on the day of. He's got to go to Barksdale and he's got to go to Offutt. And here's the other back door, right? One idea is that the invisible government has the launch codes. The other thing is that Global Guardian has built into the exercise a back door. And the back door is attempts to penetrate the command using the internet. And a bad insider, a rogue, who had access to a key command and control system to launch. So here's another door where a rogue element actually could launch. And that is related to the ultimatum to Russia. I think we mentioned this. If you say we're taking Afghanistan and parts of Central Asia, suppose Putin says no. They are ready to escalate, and it doesn't involve Bush. Bush and Cheney will not have to make any decisions because the rogue network can do all of that by themselves. All these people are irrelevant. Of course, he's sitting there with his five heart attacks and four pacemakers, dead-eyed dick. He's got his wife yammering that she wants to listen to CNN, so turn down the interagency briefing that's running the U.S. government. Um, not a good candidate to run anything. You've got the overall shift to worldwide sneak attack. That's called global strike. I think people are aware of this. Since last August, we've been operating on the idea that Cheney is looking for a new 9-11 as a pretext for an attack on Iran large-scale air assault on Iran with conventional and tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, this is from the American, spec uh, the American conservative. And what uh, the Independent International Truth Commission has done is to monitor these things with these kinds of websites. In particular, we focused on Charleston, South Carolina. There was such a furor, August 15th of last year, the local paper said, this chatter has stirred up folks all over the low country worried that nuclear fallout could seriously ruin their weekend. <laughs> and this is exactly what you want. This is what I appeal to you to do. And in a place like this, I think it would be uh, quite, uh, quite feasible. If you learn of large-scale war and terror drills in your area involving weapons of mass destruction, atomic bacteriological chemical, you want to shut them down. You want them not to occur. We don't need them. They're expensive. They tie up traffic. If they go bad, they lead to genocide. So we don't want them in our backyard, do we? And this is an area where any honest ecologist, any anti-globalization activist would go along. So this one was actually shut down by Citizen Action. Uh, this was sudden response. It, it was based on, well, they try to make it more robust and we try to add in fidelity. That begs the question, what's maximum fidelity for such a drill that the thing actually goes off? How about this? The gas dispensers in New York, four gas dispensers in Manhattan, August 8th of last year. Well, it's supposed to be colorless, odorless, and tasteless, except it stays in the area for 3,000 years. And what if a rogue comes along and says, let's take out that colorless, odorless, odorless tasteless, and here we'll try some potassium cyanide and see how that works. Easy to do. And Cheney wants war with Iran. So Bush has said all options are on the table. Putin has responded last summer with his own threats. Lowering the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons is a dangerous trend. Somebody may feel tempted to use nuclear weapons. If that happens, the next step can be taken. More powerful nuclear arms can be used, which may lead to a nuclear conflict. This extremely dangerous trend is in the back of the mind of some politicians and military officials. Now that is a counter threat, I would submit, from somebody who is actually talking from a position of significant strength and telling Bush, don't do it. This is what we want to stop, and this is what 9-11 Truth can do. This is a Chechen terrorist living in Washington, D.C., paid for by your tax money. His name is Elias Akhmadov, and he gets money from the State Department, and his contribution has been to murder women and children at a hospital in the mid-90s. In other words, the war on terror is a fraud. The U.S. and the British run Chechen terrorism, and this man is living proof. And he is running around Washington, D.C. I always fear I'm going to meet him in the subway. Now, finally, the appeal to the peace movement. Last summer, it, and it always happens, right, when Bush begins to bump along at the bottom of his 35% support window, he begins talking about what? He's got to defend the Iraq war, but his argument is pure 9-11. He has no Iraq argument. He only has the emotional appeal 
to generalize terror in the population based on 9-11. Philadelphia Inquirer, 9-11, the basis of the Iraq policy. And in the Washington Post, understated the lessons of September 11th. Well, it's the Samuel Huntington clash of civilizations, endless war, first against Muslims, Arabs, then against China, ultimately Russia. These different powers in the world. This is the World War III, according to Huntington. You can see that India is lining up with the US. Japan is actually in this column over here at the present time. Uh, Russia, of course, is on the other side. And it's worth pointing out that in the course of this Third World War, Israel is annihilated, according to his scenario. We've got the Bernard Lewis plan in the Middle East, dividing Iraq into three parts. The plan is to divide Iran into six or seven parts. Iranistan in the middle and the rest of these things that we see. This is where Bernard Lewis of the British Arab Bureau comes in. The other thing we have to think about is when Nixon was facing the Watergate scandal, even people like Schlesinger, Haig, and Nixon took measures to keep the nuclear football away from him. Now we have somebody who's obviously disturbed, obviously drugged to the gills, obviously increasingly unstable. There's also the unpredictable aspect of what he might do. Who will restrain Bush? And I guess the, the voters have to do it. Now here I'm just in my conclusion, I want to add my voice to what Barry said before. In particular, his unmasking of Noam Chomsky is a great public service and we, we have to be grateful to him for doing this. It's high time that these people were confronted with what they do. I have added, uh, who do we have? Seymour Hirsch. For all the wonderful things he does, what's the 9-11 story? Arundhati Roy, Gore Vidal, Galloway of the Labor Party, courageous, but what about 9-11? Academics, Ralph Nader, Air America, except for maybe one or two. Uh, Michael Parenti, The Terror Trap. And now I think the other possibility that at least has come out of an interview uh, late last week from uh, Jimmy Walter, the uh, millionaire philanthropist, and Will Willie Rodriguez, the hero of the North Tower, is that they've been in Venezuela for meetings with officials of the Chavez government, according to an interview on Alex Jones, which is getting to be quite a hot uh, channel in its own right. And it looks like the Venezuelan government is at least entertaining the possibility of having the Independent International Truth Commission, the so-called Truth Summit, as I think they described it, sometime soon. This would mean eminent personalities listening to presentations and coming up with a verdict that would be put in front of world public opinion. So I think this is one thing that we want to look for. I urge you to work for the Independent International Truth Commission. I urge you to join in the drill monitoring at those websites that I was listing. Uh, and as Phil Berg says, we need a 9-11 deep throat. Charlie Sheen, the man of the hour. Uh, I, if I, wish I, I wish I had a picture of A.J. Hammer, the great entertainment correspondent of, of Showbiz Tonight. He, these people have done more than the whole Democratic Party and the entire troop of left liberal gatekeepers and radical liberals. And remember, it was up to leftists to be the first out of the gate. Conservatives are going to be slower on these issues. And it turns out that the left liberals are the slowest of them all. They still haven't done a damn thing. So other than that, I commend my book to you, and I thank you for your kind attention. Without you, nothing. Webster Tarpley, everyone.